happened at the time. Why, why could you not? Well, I took a bad turn and um, I was advised by my doctor not to travel up to Pretoria from Port Elizabeth. Do you now feel comfortable to give evidence? I must give evidence, yes. Okay. Mr. Steenkamp, do you still think of Riva? My lady, every day. Every day of my life, morning, noon, at night, early hours of the morning, I think of her all the time. But I have indicated to the witness that if he feels uncomfortable and wanted us to stop, he should just indicate. Yes. Uh, Mr. Stienkamp, do you have any photo, photo, photographs or paintings of Riva in your house? In our house, in the lounge, dining room, bedrooms, all over. Reverse there with us. Photographs. You still talk to her? Every day, my lady. You know, people say it takes you two years, three years, and you start feeling a little bit better about the whole thing. But every day of my life is the same. I talk to her, and little things that come up. If I see a feather or something like that, Reva is with me all the time, yes. Now, Mr. Stienkop, you, you have a veranda at your house. I have, yes. And do you sit there often? That's where I spend most of my time, my lady. Ever since Reva's death, I myself have changed completely. I wouldn't say that I've become a recluse, but I can't really mix with people anymore. And I sit on that veranda at two, three o'clock in the morning, which has become a habit. And I smoke my cigarettes and drink my coffee, yes. And you use your phone for what purpose? Most of the time I haven't got very much knowledge on the new technology of, tele uh, of cell phones, but I get things virtually every day on Facebook from people that support us with photographs of Riva. I must have a couple of hundred of them, which I go through every day, yes. Uh, Mr. Steenkamp, how did this murder affect, affect your life? When you ask me that, uh, um, from that day, it's affected due to myself and my family so much. Um, and it's very difficult to explain, but our lives have just changed completely, yes. Now, if you think of the incident that happened, what do you think of? It's very difficult to to explain it. And you talk about the incident, are you talking about the murder? What happened that day? Yes. I don't wish that on any human being finding out 
what happened. It devastated us. I ended up having a stroke and so many things since then have happened where I've gone to doctors and to surgeons which I still have to go in for, for my heart and everything like that. It's, I, I just don't wish that on anybody in this whole world. Let us just put um, the family into perspective. You have a son from a previous marriage, is that? I have a son from a previous marriage, Adam. He's in England, yes. How old is he? He's 40, he's just turned 40 years old. And? And June has a daughter from a previous marriage, Simone. And how old is she? Simone is 50. Do you mind ask that I uh, ask your age? I'm 73 years old. Now, Riva gave, uh, uh, Kim gave evidence, and she indicated that you that you lived in Cape Town and then moved to PE. That is correct. I think the year 1991. In, in Port Elizabeth, uh, was Reva the only minor child? In Reva life? was the only minor child that lived with us. We will deal with the day of the incident in more detail, but you explained to me one of the consequences of what happened is that your landlord took certain steps. Yes, you know, we were at that time in financial difficulty and with the Reavers passing, the landlord, landlady, had found, found out that we, or well, I, was virtually bankrupt. <laughs> And within two weeks after Reva's death, she gave us notice in the house. We had never been behind on our rent or anything, but she gave us notice because of what she read in the newspapers. We could have stayed on, but we decided it was so distasteful of her to do something like that, that we decided to reallocate immediately. Now. Mr. Steenkamp, Kim also gave evidence that Riva indicated that she wanted to, would one day wanted to look after you. Do you know that? Yes, I do know about that. Riva left P to come up to Johannesburg thinking that things would move faster here yeah, for her, you know, in Port Elizabeth, sorry Port Elizabethans, but a little bit way behind Gauteng as far as modelling and that is concerned. So she decided to come up here, go through the whole cycle of her modelling career and there afterwards to go back into law and one day open up a her own thing and she had always said when that time comes that she would look after June and myself. Were you proud of her uh, having completed her studies? <clears throat> Very proud of Reva, yes. You know she got bursaries and she got distinctions and um, she also helped herself by going through varsity, we paid June to take it out certain, we had taken out certain insurances and that for her to go through varsity. And of course, yes, we were completely and utterly proud of her, yeah. And um, on the, as far as looking after you is concerned, you've indicated that at that time, financially, it was, you were in a difficult at, time. 
But something interesting happened on that 13th. Yes, just before the 13th, Revert phoned a mom and said, I'm on Tropica, you must watch. And June said, well, we'll have to, we are, our DSTV is not working, so we'll have to do something about it. She says, don't worry, I will pay for that for you straight away, but just make sure that you watch the episode of Tropica. So she paid your DSTV on the 13th of February? That's right. Then, unfortunately, I have to take you back to the day of the murder. Where were you? I was at work. Then, when I trained the horses, I used to get to work at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. I got a phone call from June. I couldn't really understand what she was so upset about, screaming and shouting. At first I thought most probably one of our animals had got killed or so. And she said, come home immediately, come home. Anyway, I dropped everything. And on my way home, I tried to fathom out what she tried to tell me, and then I realized that she mentioned Reva. She says, come home in mid and Reva's name was there. And that's when I started the panic. <coughs> and then driving home, I realized more and more Reva's been killed. That's, it hit me then. And it's, it's like it happened yesterday. And that's how I first heard about it. And when you got home? Oh, complete chaos. Thank God we had a, a friend of ours staying at the house and if he wasn't there I don't know a friend of mine Dave Cox and he was trying to comfort June and when we were there it was just I, I can't go into the whole thing and tell you exactly how we felt. No. Um, and you, you wanted to see somebody immediately. Who, who did you? Want? I phoned my brother immediately in Cape Town, and I said, "Mike, get up here immediately. This has happened." And within a couple of hours, he had got on the plane, and he was there with me. Why did you want to see your brother? Well, I can confide so much more in my brother, and I am sure with Mr. Pistorius and his brother, like he would confide that, so I would confide in my brother. And, and he was the first one I thought of. Uh, if, if we can just put it into perspective, your brother is then the father of Kim. My brother is the father of Kim. Now, when you think back, and during consultation you told me, of what happened that night in that house. What do you think of in the house of Mr. Pistorius where Riva was murdered? I personally think that there was an argument. Uh, can I, can I, um, I'm gonna stop you, yeah. but lady, allow me to, to stop the witness. Let us talk about what you think, how, during consultation, you told me how you think Grieva felt. Oh. Well, she must have gone through a, those split seconds. She, she must have been in so much fear and pain. That is what I think of all the time. I visualize that I can see it myself. It must have been absolutely and utterly awful. You, because of that, also tried to hurt yourself. Yes. Will you tell the court about that? At times, 
I thought with the pain that Reva went through, I used to just, I don't know whether I was going mental or whatever, but I used to take my fist and eat it up there against the walls with my knuckles. My injection from my diabetes, so I used to take the needle and shove it and turn it into my stomach and my arms to see if I could feel the same type of pain, but no. Now, are you, are you okay to continue? So, as far as your health is concerned, you said you had a stroke shortly after the incident. Yeah. And you've always also consulted doctors about your heart. Heart, I went to the doctor. They did tests on me. Just recently I had tests. I have to go into hospital in August for my valves in my heart. And you? Also, I must, which I've held back with everything now, I must go for biopsy as well. You've indicated to me that Riva's habit of phoning her parents, that was very interesting. Could you explain that to the court, yes. please? It was virtually a habit that Riva would phone her mother on Saturdays and not talk to me. But on the Sunday, we phoned me, her father, and talked to me about different things that she would talk to June about. Um, but that is how it went at most times. It was the Saturday and the Sunday. So would, she would phone you on the Sunday and only talk to you? And then talk to me. Does it happen every week? Virtually every week, yeah, when there would be the odd week that would be missed but virtually every weekend, yes. Now, you've always also indicated to me that, although every day is difficult, Christmases and birthdays are difficult. Yeah. Why? Well, Reva is not there with us. She's there with us in spirit. But like at Christmas time with the family, we would sit down and one chair would be there for Riva. And that's how we, not say celebrated Christmas, that's how we had our Christmas. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's just give a bit more details. So the, the, the last Christmas you went down to Cape Town? Yeah. To your brother? I went to my brother. And you've indicated that at the table there was a setting and a chair for Riva? A setting and a chair there for Riva. And on her birthdays, the family would have a celebration for her with the photograph, not in her house, my family, a photograph with her and her place there as well, yes. Now, the relationship between Riva and the accused. Did you know about that? I didn't know about it, no. Did she never tell you? I don't think the time was right for her to tell me, otherwise she would have told me. But I didn't know that there was a relationship. Now, have you had contact with the accused in this matter? No, no contact, but I do believe that through the lawyers there was something, but we, June and myself, declined the getting together and having a talk. Yeah. Now, A witness testified, and not only this time, but also the previous time, about the amount of money that you received every month after he was death. Yes. Um, it 
was discussed between the defence lawyer and our lawyers, our advocates, and Mr. Duke de Bruyne. They actually arranged that amongst themselves. Mr. de Bruyne approached us and told us about it. We didn't like the idea, but we were in dire straits at the time. And I said, do what you must do. And he turned around and said to me, Barry, don't worry. This will be private and confidential. So I said, I leave it up to you to do what you must do for us. Who requested that it, be, that it should be private and confidential? Um, I don't want to. I must talk the truth, but I heard it was Mr. Barry Rue, that, or, Mr. or his lawyer, that had requested that it stays private and confidential. Were you surprised when it was mentioned? I was disgusted. I was disgusted, uh, Your Honour. I was disgusted when it came out that something like that could have been brought up. And immediately, when we were offered 360, 350,000 rand, we declined it. Our lawyer said to us, you must take the money, you must do it. We said, we don't want the money after what was brought up in court here. And um, anyway, I've learned to live with that now. It makes no difference. It's my daughter that's gone. It's not the money or anything like that. Mr. Steenkamp, have you seen any of the photographs of your daughter? The only photograph that I've seen was the photograph that you produced here in court. That's the only one I've seen, but I can imagine what it was like. And this is something that I want to ask the court now. A lot of people will disagree with me and think that I'm callous or whatever it is. But what I would like the world to see uh, are the wounds inflicted on Tureva and the pain that she must have gone through so that the world can see this and most probably distract people who are thinking of that type of deed to stop them in future. And this is why I ask if something like that could be shown to everybody. Apart Which room? Yeah, no, please. Yeah. Let's carry on which will help for the future, I don't know. But this is the way I feel at the moment. Uh, Mr. Senkop, you, apart from that one photograph that was shown in court, you haven't seen any of the others? No. Okay. Now, your wife, June, how is she doing? You know, through the media, through a lot of people, have said that June is the stone-faced person, does she actually feel, or whatever, I know, that June grieves like I do all the time. She's most probably a bit stronger, but she grieves. I hear her at night. I hear her cry. I hear her talking to Reva. Yeah. And, of course, she feels, she feels just as much as I do. Thank you, Mr. Hafner. I think so.